birthdays and some anniversaries. I see somebody's already got her dollar out. Uh, so we'll celebrate those and then get started. All right, let's do birthdays. Birthdays to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly being. And crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Now, let me pray for us, and we'll get started. Father in heaven, uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for your presence here among us. God, I pray for those of us that uh, have come through those doors this morning burdened and um, worried. God, filled with uh, sin or anxieties uh, or just the weight of life has been pressing out of us the joy of the Lord. God, I pray that you would meet us here this morning. God, remind us that your burden is light and that your yoke is easy. That your son Jesus is gentle and lowly in heart. And that he has come specifically to save sinners. God, that he's come to welcome us in uh, to your very own family. God, I pray that we would remember those of us in Christ. 
Christ. I pray that we would remember who we are and where we stand with you this morning. God, that we would get just a, a small sense of our belovedness through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, would you meet us as we worship? God, would the words that come out of our mouth be felt and visceral and genuine in our hearts? God, would we worship you in spirit and in truth? And God, I pray that as the songs uh, end and we take a seat, that we would submit ourselves to the authority and the glory of your word. God, that it would change us, it would transform us. Uh, that if there be any wicked way uh, in me, or any wicked way in any of us, that you would uh, call that out and cleanse it by the blood of your Son. God, we thank you for today. What a gift the local church is. God, I ask all these things in the beautiful and holy, holy, holy name of your Son, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Flashback today, some of us wore our cave crew shirts from 2016, so eight years ago. Our Bible school was Cave Quest, so we had lots of stalactites and stalagmites up here, and it was glittery, and there was glitter everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Glitter forever. <laughs> Probably still glitter in the carpet, right. but it was you great. The stalactite and the stalagmite? Yes, stalactite hangs from the ceiling and yeah. holds on tight. Ah, okay. Stalagmites from the ground. <laughs> so we're going to sing Majestic this morning um, from that Cave Quest BBS from 2016. <coughs>
Oh, yeah. 
stand, we're going to sing the old rugged cross. Those are your first and last verses.
Nazareth. We'll be back in Matthew chapter 5 today, starting there uh, in verse 21. Just to give you a little encouragement on the way the Lord works. Uh, I had absolutely no idea that our first song was going to be the, what's it, title? Majestic. Majestic, which is just Psalm 8, just Psalm mm-hmm. Had no earthly idea, and just out of random uh, choosing, chose to read Psalm 8 for our text this morning. So it just uh, shows you how the Lord was working that together for us. Um, Me and Kelly, uh, my wife, like to play this fun game together. Uh, At least I think it's fun. Um, (laughs) And the game is, is basically this. And now that I'm talking about it, I think Jonathan and Corey also like to play this game. Uh, the game is basically this. I, uh, very innocently, uh, like to mess with Kelly. Uh, and I, what I like to do is drive her right to the edge uh, uh, of just going crazy and hurling something at me uh, like my mom used to. Uh, and she's not up here to defend herself, so I shouldn't say that. Uh, I like to drive her just right to the edge. Uh, and I'm not sure if there are winners uh, in this game, um, but I win every time. <laughs> and one of my favorite things to do is whenever, you know, she gets all up in arms and she's right on the edge and uh, she starts, you know, yelling, stop touching me, Lou. I'm serious, stop touching me. Uh, what I like to do is follow that rule exactly as she has said it. And I stop touching her. And I get my hands all around her. I say, Kelly, I'm not touching you. Kelly, Kelly, look, I'm not touching you. I'm doing exactly what you told me, Kelly. I'm not touching you. Uh, and she loves this. Don't, don't give me <laughs> she, she absolutely loves this. Uh, so the question is, am I following her rules in that moment? Yes, I am. The answer is yes. Uh, is it any less annoying to her? Uh, no. Uh, the answer is no to that one. But the reason I bring that up uh, is to not only give you a, a quick look into our home life, but uh, to give you a silly example uh, of what is being unpacked in some way in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if, when Kelly tells me to stop touching her, technically in that moment, I'm following the letter of her law. Right? I refrain from touching her. I'm doing verbatim what she has told me not to do. I'm not touching her just like she's asked. But in that moment, am I truly following the intent uh, or the heart behind her rule? And the answer, of course, is no, I'm not. The letter of the law in that moment is, Luke, for the love, stop touching me. But the intent of that law is, Luke, stop annoying me. And one of those I am doing, and the other I am very much not accomplishing. Uh, and it's this approach to the law that Jesus is speaking out, uh, speaking about in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, he's made clear in the last few weeks uh, that he has not come to do away with the Old Testament law. He hasn't come to abolish it, but rather to fulfill it, uh, to rather fill it up full. I like that language uh, of that, to fulfill the Old Testament law and the prophets. Uh, and what that looks like is Jesus taking the law and then exegeting and explaining it so that his disciples... Uh, can truly seek to follow it according to uh, not merely the letter of it and the outward action of the law, but the deeper intent and the heart behind the law, the attitudes. That's so important as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. The attitudes that the law is actually after. Uh, And like we've said from last week, uh, from week one all the way to last week, is that Jesus is after a deeper and a truer, a more whole, righteousness in the lives of his followers. And that righteousness, he says, must be greater than and exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And what Jesus will begin showing us this morning is that a legalistic reading of the law that is merely action-based, it just won't get us there. Uh, But rather what he's after is whole person. Uh, I think that's helpful language as we think about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. He's after whole person, inwardly and totally transformed disciples uh, who follow not merely the actions of the law, but the attitude and the heart of the law. 
in the first example he's going to give us here of this deeper righteousness uh, is with a topic uh, that I just considered skipping because I know that we just don't struggle with this. Uh, but no, it's a topic that each one of us in this room is impacted with. Uh, so let me pray for us uh, this morning. And we're going to look at two ways that anger impacts us and how Jesus expects us to respond with a deeper whole person to righteousness. Uh, so let me pray and we'll begin. Father in heaven, uh, I thank you for your word. I thank you that uh, even as I am studying and reading and preparing this week, I'm reminded, just as I am every single week, of how much I don't measure up. And Lord, that could that could do two things uh, to my heart, and it could do two things to our hearts this morning. Uh, it can push us into shame and condemnation, uh, which is the very thing that your word says your son did not come to bring. Uh, or it can push me to be in utter awe of the grace of Jesus. That despite my failure to measure up, despite our failures in this room to be who you want us to be, God, you love us. God, you love us in the midst of that. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of what it takes to be your disciple. And then remind us again of the abundance of grace that you give when we fall short. Uh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus. God, I pray that the meditation of all of our hearts this morning and the words of my mouth uh, would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Uh, and I don't have a podium mic this morning, so I'm going to try to uh, talk louder so if you can't hear me. Uh, I apologize. Uh, you can listen to the podcast uh, tomorrow, and it will be all the same stuff. Unless I add anything after, which I haven't thought about, but that would make sense. Uh, let's see here. So point number one, uh, as we talk about this this morning, uh, the first direction that Jesus takes us is this. If you're a note taker, point number one is this. Anger in the heart. Anger in the heart. Verse 21 through uh 22 says this you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be liable to judgment whoever insults them will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire uh, one of my previous pastors who was uh more blunt, I guess, than uh, maybe some others. Uh, he would always say this, and it, it stuck with me, probably because of its, its bluntness. Uh, but he would say something along the lines of this. Uh, you can always convince yourself that you're not that bad of a sinner, uh, as long as you keep comparing yourself to the morons that you hang out with. And I thought, you know what, that's pretty fair. Uh, uh, it's not often very hard for us to think of someone in our life or in our sphere of the world we occupy and think, well, you know, at least I'm not as bad as them. Uh, at least I'm not doing the things that they're doing. Uh, and it's that very attitude that Jesus is ruthlessly going after here in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, he's after a level of repentance and deeper righteousness uh, that not only exceeds that of your friends who you consider to be uh, moronic, but he says your righteousness should exceed and be greater than that of the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders, uh, or as the Jesus Storybook Bible calls them, the extra super holy people. Right. He says our righteousness should exceed theirs. It should be greater than theirs. And the first way that Jesus intends uh, to judge our level of righteous living, the litmus test, the first thing is by holding up our lives up against the truth found in the Sixth Commandment that says we should not murder. Uh, and instead of just saying something like this uh, to us, come on guys, uh, just don't murder. It's really not that hard to accomplish. Uh, and then moving on to whatever his next law is, Jesus actually, uh, by focusing and expanding on the Sixth Commandment, stops each and every one of us in our tracks. 
And essentially he says this, uh, wait just a minute. Those of you who immediately tuned out when I brought up murder because you think I've never murdered someone uh, and I certainly don't have any plans to, uh, at least not that I've verbalized, uh, <laughs> Jesus would say, you are not as innocent in view of this command as you would think. And then Jesus does, uh, uh, what he then does is, like we said, he intends to pick up the law and fill it full, to reveal its true intent and then its practical reality in our lives. And, and before we move on, uh, lest we skip over the shock of this, let's not quickly move past the simple fact that Jesus has just related anger to murder. Uh, that is an incredibly weighty thing to do, an incredibly weighty thing for him to say. And for those of us who think we are so far removed from the guilt of the murderer, Jesus again says to us, well, not so fast. It, it's not enough to merely not physically murder someone. But he would say, rather, if you harbor anger and malice and contempt toward another, then the verdict over you and me is guilty. Which means this, our hearts have known murder, regardless of if our hands have been covered in blood. Or right. Amen. The act of murder is merely the fruit of the wickedness that is lurking beneath the surface yes. in all of us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 15 says this, Everyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Uh, D.A. Carson is again helpful here. He says, judgment thought to be reserved for the actual murderers, in reality, hangs over the wrathful and the spiteful and the contemptuous. And he asks this, who then stands uncondemned? Uh, those of us who tend to live, uh, live out their faith in a more legalistic manner, by the letter of the law and not the intent, uh, whether that's consciously or just in practice, uh, those who live out their faith more legalistically tend to believe that the primary goal of following Jesus is to sin less, is to sin less. And while sinning less is obviously a part of it, it's not the main thing. Now, if sinning less was the whole point of following Jesus, then the Pharisees and the scribes would be our best examples yeah. in following Jesus and yeah. not his most often rebuked antagonists. Right. Right. Does Jesus want us to sin less? Yeah. Yes, yeah. full stop. He wants us to sin less. That is a big part of his plan for our life, to sin less. But the main goal is that you and I would be with. Yeah. And in being with Jesus, we would then become like Jesus. Amen. That we would live in the love of Christ and then walk in the perfect mold of Christ yeah. likeness. And that mold includes sinning less, yes, but it's certainly not the whole picture. It's about communion with God and then growing to be a person of the love of God. The greatest commandment, according to Jesus, isn't that we sin less, <coughs> but rather that we devote all of who we are, all of our faculties, into loving God yeah. and loving our neighbor. Amen. Uh, Jesus isn't merely after sinful actions. What he's after is our sinful attitudes as well. Uh, and what Jesus wants in this text is not merely a person uh, who never murders anyone. What he wants is a person who has been so radically transformed from the inside that through the spirit-filled power of Christ himself, you're able to not only refrain from murder, but also refrain from the anger that would take you there. Right. And not only refrain from the anger that would take you there, but go so far as to love your enemies right. and pray for those who persecute you. Amen. The world is angry. The world is angry. You want to stand out. 
to be a light in this dark and sinful world. You want to be salt and light in this world? Quit being so empty. The world has that. We'll let them have it. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. Don't let your spirit rush to be angry, for anger abides. And remember, I'm not saying this. This is the Bible. Right. Anger abides in the heart of fools. Yeah. Proverbs 29, verse 11. A fool <coughs> gives full vent to his anger, but a wise person holds it in check. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Amen. For human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Yeah. Amen. Uh, and some of you may be thinking this, so let me address it. Here's what's true. Not all anger is wrong. Not all anger is wrong. Uh, anger against sin and injustice is right and good and modeled by Jesus himself. Amen. Uh, oftentimes, if we're not angry, something is wrong. Uh, but notice the stark differences in us and Jesus. Jesus is angry, angrier than we could ever imagine, at the sin itself. But most often, you and I are angry at the person doing the sin. Jesus hates sin. He hates sin. <coughs> Jesus, very much so, hates my sin, despises my sin. And here's how much he hates my sin. Jesus hates my sin, is so angry at my sin that he went so far as to sacrifice himself to rid me of it. Amen. Which means this, he hates my sin, but man, he loves me. Amen. Amen. But how often do we not only hate the sin, but we hate the sinners too? Amen. This fell kind of perfectly uh, on the first Sunday in June. June is, as you know, unless you live under a rock, uh, is celebrated as Pride Month. And my question is this. What, a, what if, instead of vocalizing our anger and displeasure towards those who think and act and believe differently than us, what if we were rightly angry? What if we hated the sin of homosexuality so much, we hated it so much, that every time we heard someone celebrate it, or we saw a post that celebrated it, what if we hated that sin so much that we can think of nothing else to do than to fall on our faces right then and there and pray that God would rid that person yeah. of that sinful desire? Right. Amen. What if we loved the sinner and hated the sin so much that we don't even have time to make an angry post on Facebook because we're doing the real work that actually matters and spending our time down on our knees asking God to show that person the very same mercy that he showed to us Amen. time and time again. Yeah. They call Jesus the friend of sinners. And that's not in any way because he was all love and no truth and no anger. Right. But rather because sin made Jesus so angry he did whatever it took to be a friend to sinners and help those sinners find freedom yeah. from sin. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I love what God says to Jonah in uh, chapter 4. Jonah is uh, upset that the Lord would show Nineveh mercy because through his all-wise eyes compared to God, they didn't deserve mercy. Uh, and God so graciously looks down on Jonah uh, and even provides him shade in the sun. And he enters into Jonah's pity party. I don't know of another way to uh, describe it. And says this. This is so good. He says, Jonah, do you do well to be angry? I love that. How often does he say that to us? Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Uh, as if God is saying to him, saying to Jonah in this moment, do you not also, Jonah, depend on the very same mercy that I have shown to you? Do you have any right to be angry, Jonah? The Bible is clear. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Uh, Jesus says in uh, Luke chapter 6, something along these lines, a, a familiar verse. 
He says, but if you love only those who love you, then what credit is that to you? He says, even the sinners and the tax collectors do that. Uh, and I think I could rephrase that for our time this morning. Again, not Bible, but just my sanctified imagination. I think Jesus would say something like this. So you haven't murdered anyone. Uh, well, what credit is that to you? Even the Pharisees and the scribes don't do that. Right. But church, the deeper righteousness that Jesus is after in the Sermon on the Mount starts on the inside. Uh, and it starts with us repenting of our angry hearts. Because here's what's true. Angry Christians don't please Jesus. And here's what's especially true. Angry Christians certainly don't win anyone to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Point number two is this. Anger in the church. Anger in the church. Verse 23 through 26 says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, uh, and, and just as a point of, I don't know what translation you read, but almost every single time, uh, anytime it says brother, you can replace it with brother and sister. Mm -hmm. uh, I just like to point that out. So it's not just talking to the men uh, or those who are brothers. Um, he says this. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Uh, what Jesus does is he now shifts his focus from the anger that's found within uh, to when that anger gets out. And the way that that anger plays itself out in broken relationships and unresolved conflict. And he gives two examples in these uh, last few verses of this section of practical ways that anger will take us over. Uh, that anger takes over and causes conflict and how you and I are to respond in a Christ-like manner instead. And the first is directly related to a worship service. And then the second is much more general. Uh, but for the sake of time, we're just going to focus in uh, on that first one. And what Jesus does is he paints a scene here in this moment of a person fulfilling their religious duty. Uh, they're being a good churchgoer, a good churchman, of giving a gift at the altar. And then he says this, if there you remember, in the middle of your religious duty, in the middle of the worship service, if there you remember... That there is unresolved conflict between you and a brother or sister. Then drop your gift, leave it, and go make things right. Uh, Jesus encourages here what has gotten him in trouble with the religious leaders time and time again. He puts people before religious duty. And the message here is simple. You cannot be in right relationship with God. And at the same time, be in wrong relationship with people. Amen. Uh, or to simplify it even more, your love and devotion to God is only as genuine as your love and care for people. Amen. And this message is especially true inside the walls of the church. So often, I think we wonder why it seems so difficult or why we don't walk in constant communion with God, or why our prayer lives can feel dull and lifeless, or why our Bible reading is so boring and never life-giving, or even why our prayers for good things, why our prayers for this church may not be being answered, and we don't see God moving here how we would expect Him to or how we want Him to. And the question we have to ask, ask, the question we have to ask ourselves is could it be from this very thing that Jesus is here warning us about? <coughs> could it be that our religious duty is empty because we have unresolved conflict and a lack of reconciliation with our brothers and sisters? There's been one gathering uh, in my entire life that I can look back on and know without a doubt uh, that the Lord moved in power because of 
reconciliation that took place in that room. Uh, there was a church that had been stagnant for years and had one single day, uh, one single day of spirit-filled time where the people in the room were up on their feet and in tears going to other people in the room and just confessing sin to those that they had heard or they'd been treated poorly or holding grudges against or just had a general dislike of people all across the room going to others. And now that I look back on it, it's truly like that day forward, the Lord doused that church with gasoline. Amen. And he hasn't stopped moving there in power ever since. Amen. Praise God for that. And it just goes to show you the message of Jesus time and time again remains true. Our horizontal relationships with each other directly affect our vertical relationship with God. Yes. Amen. In all of our worship services and prayer meetings and servings and trips and studying and everything in between, it's all meaningless if we don't truly love one another. Amen. And here's what I want to do uh, as we close. Uh, I want to remind us and call us into three things. Uh, if there's any anger or animosity in our hearts and our lives, uh, then I believe these three things are exactly what Jesus would expect of us moving forward. Number one is simple, uh, simple but hard. Number one is repent. If we are sinfully angry, whether that be at the world itself, uh, at a brother or sister, or even at God, the first thing we all must do is confess our sins to God, yeah. making no excuses. Maturing in Christ is realizing this. Maturing in Christ is realizing that our angry heart is nobody's fault except our own. Yeah. You and I cannot control what others do or what they say, but every single time we can control how we respond. Right. Our own hearts are the root of the problem, not others. We must start by repenting of our sinful Number two, praise God for this. Number two is this. Receive the gift of grace in Jesus. Yeah. Uh, in Genesis, when Cain murdered his brother Abel, uh, the Bible says something along these lines. It says that Abel's, Abel's blood cried out from the ground God. for justice to God. Uh, and the truth is that that <laughs> same murderous, guilty blood is on all of our hands. Whether we have actually murdered or not, what we've seen from Jesus is that our angry hearts make us equally as guilty as Cain. Yeah. Amen. Here's the best news in all the world. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, says that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than that of the blood of Abel. Right. Means this the blood of Jesus cleanses us of our guilt and our sin. The blood of Jesus cries out a word, not of condemnation, but of forgiveness and acceptance and reconciliation between us and God. The blood of Jesus welcomes a murderer like me and like you into the presence and the family of a holy God. And by faith, you and I have received that gift. We receive the better word spoken over us. And number three is this. This puts the boots on the ground. We're called to reconcile specifically. Listen to verse 23 and 24. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Uh, what Jesus does is he gives pretty specific instructions here. He says, if you have offended or hurt another, if you have treated another poorly, then leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person. So what that means is that if God brings specific people or specific instances to your mind. Yeah. 
in your first and greatest act of worship is not what you can do at the altar. It's not what you can do at the altar of this church. Your first act of worship is to go and make things right with that person. I said it a few weeks ago at our prayer service, and I think it's worth repeating. God will not move in a church or a person that is marked by disunity and conflict. Right. But the flip side of that is this. What might he do? If you and I are marked by reconciliation right. and love and seeking to outdo one another in showing honor. That's what gospel culture Amen. is. That's the embodiment the embodiment of it. What might God do if his people walk in unison toward reconciliation and righteousness? Now, let me pray for us. Father in heaven, God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word leaves us with no excuses. And I thank you for the grace of Jesus as our gospel welcome reminded us this morning that those who are without excuse can collapse in the arms of Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, I pray that if there is any conflict, any unresolved disunity in this room, that reconciliation would be more important than lunch. That reconciliation would be more important than anything that comes after it. God, we love you. God, we want to see you move in this church. God, we know that you moved in places that are prepared for you to live. And God, I pray that you would prepare us, prepare our hearts, prepare uh, this church, prepare us in unity for you to move in mighty ways. Lord, we love you. We thank you for today. We thank you for the grace of your son, Jesus. It's in his name I ask all these things. Please stand with us and I surrender all. <clears throat> specifically for scuba here, but also to the churches in the area. There are so many kids that are coming through. They may go to multiple ones. This may be the only one. Uh, these, this is our chance to go and sow those seeds, to go and water them, to help spread the message. So, uh, 
So uh, they're going to give you little seashells. Uh, these are actually from the beach. Some of them are a little broken, some are whole, some are tiny, some are big. Just like us, we can go and be useful. These shells are just going to be just as useful. So, if, so uh, got Forrest over here and we got the girls in the back. And please go and take your shelf from them. Um, and if you've not signed up for pizza tonight and you plan on eating the sign up sheets, we moved the sign up table to the back. And if you'll just give um, like a dollar for each slice, and if you want breadsticks, throw in some extra money, you can give that to me. I'm going to place the order after church, and then we'll pick it up in time for us to eat it tonight. And then also you will see there are yard signs. If you've already gotten one and you want to put another one back to back with yours because they're not two-sided, we've got extras back there. So please um, get them and use them. And um, be praying and get the word out about Bible school on um, next week. Uh, if you see any Enon or Hague or North Highland signs, just go place ours on either side of it. <laughs> <laughs> that should take care of the, the kids who want to get here. <laughs> All right, let's apologize and we'll be dismissed.